This video is sponsored by Black Wolf. In the fall of 2018, I took an acting directing workshop in Mumbai with a guy named Atul Mongia. I didn't know it at the time, but he's like a famous acting coach. In Bollywood, he trained up people like Ranveer Singh and Vicky Koshal. If you don't know, they're like huge superstars in India. Now I've been passionate about acting and the stage all my life. My first performance was at the age of seven. And all my life, people just told me I was a great actor. And it's not actually because I'm amazing, it's because I grew up in Minnesota. And while there's a lot of talented people here, the pool is limited. It's just not as competitive as it would be in a big city. That workshop in Mumbai by comparison was a whole different beast. I was definitely out of my element. First of all, all of our scenes were in Hindi. So I didn't have complete mastery of the language. I mean, I speak fluent Hindi, but I wasn't used to acting in Hindi. And when I finished my first scene, after I finished, he said, why are you so weird? Why are you so dramatic? It was like the first day I didn't know anyone. I was kind of taken aback. My feelings were a bit hurt. I was like, I don't, I'm not trying to be weird. I don't, what do you mean by this? And he said, just look at your body language. You're so dramatic. You're always posing. Like you're acting like you're on like the cover of GQ right now, even though we're all just in an acting class. And I guess I didn't realize, but yeah, I have dramatic body language. Maybe I had a little bit of an over the top personality in that moment. And when we were doing introductions, it might've seemed like I was trying to project myself in a certain way. And he said, you're trying really hard right now to be a cool guy. And I get the sense that all your life, you have tried to be the cool guy. And he said to me, do you know why I think this is? And I said, no. And he said, you've never fully fit into a room. You've always stood out in some way because you grew up in Minnesota. Most of the people in your classes probably didn't look like you. And now in my class here, you're doing such bad over the top acting because you still don't quite belong. Even here in a room amongst Indians, probably one of the few times where everyone is interested in art, everyone looks like you, you stand out. You just are different. It's something that I didn't realize weighed on me, but I guess I had to admit he was right. Perhaps subconsciously or just deep within my experiences, I had been harboring an instinct of needing people to know that I belonged. And this performative aspect of wanting to be seen as not just belonging, but being cool, had probably had a subconscious effect on how I'd behaved throughout my entire life. About 26% of the US population are either first or second generation immigrants. I think around 12% are second generation immigrants, which means if you're like me, you're a US citizen, you were born here, but my parents are not, my parents were born in India. It's not rare to be a second generation immigrant, but I do think it's a unique experience, a unique environment. And I wanted to make a video that reflects upon my experience growing up as like a perfect balance between two cultures. Anyway, I thought it might be interesting for me to share five lessons that I learned from my Indian American experience. So here goes. The first lesson that I've learned is that a person's name carries weight. With a little effort, you can make someone feel much more welcome and respected if you take the effort to say their name right. And even if the pronunciation is difficult, to at least acknowledge their name, try to get it as correct as possible. Now, my name isn't extremely complicated compared to some names out there. It's Nick Hill. It sounds like two Anglo-Saxon names just put into one. In fact, sometimes when I introduce myself and I say my name's Nick Hill, people think I'm telling them my full name, which like is Nick and Hill. But throughout my life, a lot of people have butchered my name, especially like the teachers growing up. And most of the time I'm super forgiving with pronunciation and all that. But sometimes you have to wonder like, why are you so stupid? I can't tell you the number of times that a teacher would say something like, oh, Nikki, Nikki Pandy, there's clearly an L at the end, teacher. But I've realized that there is a bit of an emotional tax that is carried over one's lifetime when you have to constantly explain your name, just correct your name. And actually the first time I realized how much of a thing this is, is when I went to a Starbucks in Mumbai and it was the first time where I didn't say my name was Nick. The server who was preparing my coffee said, what's the name on the order? And I said, Nick Hill. And then there was nothing after that. And then when I got my coffee, it just had my name on it and it was spelled perfectly. And I legit had never had that experience in my life prior. It was kind of a big deal for me at that moment. It, it blew me away. I'm not saying that I expect this from coffee shops in the US ever. All I'm saying is I realized in that moment that it means a lot to people when you say their name how they want it to be said. And a lot of people make the claim like, I'm bad with names, I can't say someone's name, or I'm really bad with pronunciation. But I've found that most of the time pronunciation isn't really that hard. Of course, growing up in college, I would read a lot of productivity blogs and the book Flow would come up all the time. And the author's name of Flow is 
this long. Every blog post about Flo would mention the author and his crazy name, but really it's just Mihai Chik sent me high. You can say it, Mihai Chik sent me high. Of course you can't pronounce it when you first read it probably, but if you met Mihai, you would just ask him like, how do you say your name? And then it would be really simple. And I'm sure that if you were to just make his name feel ordinary, like it belonged in the cultural zeitgeist, then that would carry some weight. It carries some like respect. The second lesson that I learned is that I had a fear of fulfilling the stereotypes associated with my ethnicity where I really didn't need to. Growing up, there were certain stereotypes about being a South Asian guy that I was just painfully aware of. Really, there were only a handful of representations that I could look to in media. Of course, media had a big impact on middle school Nikhil, but that was Apu from The Simpsons. And like a couple of CW dramas where the Indian guy was always just like this crazy nerd. In fact, at the age of 15, one of the first acting auditions I'd ever gotten was for this TV show, Nip Tuck. And the role was for a 15 year old doctor, an Indian doctor, who is performing a breast reduction on one of his clients. And he gets so excited about this woman and the surgery that he loses control of himself. She's in my pants. Now, when I entered middle school and then high school, I just had this painful awareness that I could potentially be seen as like a nerdy dorky guy. A lot of this was in my head, but also it is true that Indian parents and Asian parents in general, they do put a lot of pressure on like academics to the point where they don't want your mental real estate to be on anything other than academics so that you can just focus on school and success. But I had this desperate want to be seen as a counterexample to this. As a middle schooler, I would make vision boards of clothes I wanted to wear, like a Patrick Bateman level psycho. And I would like budget out buying nice clothes and I would try to like run as a middle schooler so I could lose the baby fat and get fit and just look cool. I guess early on I realized there was a power in clothes and appearance and that was just an easy way to let people know that I wasn't a nerd, okay? I mean, I was smart, I could get things done, but I also wanted to be seen as like a main character, as socially adept. <laughs> We have to work in the sponsor. Do you have any sketch ideas? Do you have anything like, is there You're something? You're capitalizing on your own experience to make money? This video is sponsored by Black Wolf. Black Wolf is a men's wellness brand helping men feel and look their best through skin, body, and hair care products. And they're kind enough to sponsor the channel today. Their products are made with the best possible active ingredients to clean, soothe, and hydrate your skin. Plus, they're vegan, and all of their products are reasonably priced, meaning you don't have to take out a loan to feel good about yourself. Black Wolf cuts out the middleman and ships direct, so you don't pay more for unnecessary steps between the manufacturer and the retailer. You can even subscribe and get refills delivered to suit your schedule. Click the link in my description to get Black Wolf's best-selling charcoal-infused products in this exclusive face and body wash bundle and receive a free body scrubber and toiletry bag valued at $29. All of that for $31 total, plus free shipping in the US. Essentially, you're getting over 50% added value if you use my link, and the products smell amazing. It's sponsors like Black Wolf that help us reinvest in the channel and make more high effort videos, such as the upcoming Coen Brothers director series, and actually the one after that is the first female director, Zoya Ukter, for the Bollywood director series. And these videos would not be possible without our sponsors. So thank you, Black Wolf, for sponsoring this video, and thank you all for watching. The third lesson that I've learned is that displaying your heritage is a source of immense translated energy. Once I'd sort of gotten over my fear about sharing my heritage with the world, my culture, my Indianness. Actually, there was a point in my later years of high school when I was actually excited to share all this with people. One of the coolest examples was my high school, which has like 3,800 students, has a yearly tradition called Mr. Wyzetta, where the senior girls pick 10 guys to put on a male pageantry, like a talent show. And I guess I was picked because I was kind of well known amongst the theater squad. And what I decided to do for my talent show was like a Bollywood action sequence and song and dance, like a full on Bollywood moment. And I taught this choreography to like a bunch of my friends and we performed it at the pageantry and I was blown away by just the audience response. I mean, not to gas myself up or anything, but like we really got the crowd going. What I realized is sharing your heritage or just sharing the best of your culture can be a source of immense energy for everyone. There's something powerful about seeing the best of tradition and heritage boldly on display. And I'm not saying this only applies to like non-white cultures. I think this applies to 
every heritage. One of my favorite YouTube videos is like a bunch of Scottish guys on the street and they're just jamming to just this traditional Scottish music. It sounds fantastic. And the top comment on that video says, makes me very proud to be Scottish, which is interesting given the fact that I'm Portuguese. The best of heritage equals energy. Everyone can feel it. The fourth lesson I learned is that seeing yourself represented in popular media is meaningful. Representation is meaningful. One of my favorite shows is actually the six part HBO miniseries called The Night Of. In fact, this channel's name, Sinbad, came from a dialogue in that show. But that series is about a Muslim Pakistani American college student who gets involved in some trouble. And then this is not a big spoiler. It's like a really tiny spoiler. At the end of the first episode, he ends up in jail. At the start of the second episode, his parents find out that he's in jail and his dad is rushing the mom to get them to jail. They wanna go visit their son to find out what's happened. And she tells her husband to wait just a minute because she needs to pack the paratas, basically like tortillas, it's just bread and potatoes wrapped up. And she's saying, wait just a minute, I'll get the food ready while she's packing it in tinfoil. And when I first saw that, like I didn't realize tinfoil could make me so emotional, but like that has been my life, the tinfoil, that moment when the food is wrapped in tinfoil. It is so exact to my experience growing up. And for that moment to be captured in like a, at the time, a very big HBO series, it won like several Emmys, it was so meaningful to me. And I'm from an Indian ancestry, not Pakistani, and our family is Hindu, not Muslim, but it's still translated. Just seeing that moment captured, it made me feel like the tinfoil is a part of American culture. And as a result, like I am a part of American culture more now. And the last point is this, we can choose to create our own narratives regarding our heritage and legacy. And we have the choice to either empower or disempower ourselves with our narratives. A lot of people I've come across in my life, like people from my mom's temple circle, kids my age, fellow Indian Americans, many of them are not attached or not knowledgeable about you know where their parents came from, either out of neglect, like it just never cropped up, they never experienced it that well. And on the opposite end, there have been some like me who have been like extremely interested and proud of it. On the other end, I've even had like white friends say to me, I'm kind of jealous that you have all this. Like, I wish I had more culture. You've got so much cool stuff that you've got going on. I had a friend especially say this to me when I showed her like a video, I was at a wedding and uh, Indian weddings, often there is something called a barat where the groom is on a horse and all around him, his groomsmen are dancing and there's like drums playing and they're dancing on the way. There's like a big parade on the way to get to the bride and get to the ceremony. And when I showed her that, she said, oh, we don't have anything this exciting. And I had to disagree with her because I had never had that experience of like a classic Christmas morning or a Christmas Eve where there's a fireplace going and everyone's getting together and exchanging presents or something like Thanksgiving. I mean, there's so much life and richness in those traditions as well that I've only experienced as an adult but as a kid, I would look at it and think like, that's amazing. I guess what I've realized ultimately from my upbringing is that no matter where you come from, we have an opportunity to define ourselves and project who we are to the world. And to a large degree, we get to choose, at least internally, who we are. That acting teacher back in the day told me I'm like this weird person who overacts and has weird body language because I've never fit in or I've stood out or something. But I no longer see it that way. I, I think every experience and every lineage and heritage that I've had access to, all the tradition, has only given me like a better perspective, one that I'm really grateful for. Anyway, that was sort of a different style of video. I've been curious to try out different things on the channel, different topics, rather than just what I've been sticking to over the last year. So let me know what you think of this video. But with that being said, for those of us who are willing to own where we came from and use it to push forward, to us I say greatness is coming. Cheers. <laughs>